So many of you know that I had the privilege to intern as a hospital chaplain this summer, two of the local uh, Trenton Capital Health Hospitals. And it truly was a life-altering experience that opened my eyes to the uh, needs of the people that we, as part of the universal church, have been commissioned by Christ to serve. The beautiful thing about uh, a ministry such as hospital chaplaincy is the diversity of the people that you get to serve. Illness has no boundaries. It doesn't discriminate. Um, there was a few misconceptions that I did have about this going into the program. The first being that I was going to be the resident Bible expert. And I'll let you guess how many times I got into deep philosophical and theological uh, discussions with people, with patients in their rooms. Right, zero. <laughs> Much of this may have been in the seminarians here, where people are sick, dying, they don't really care about Luther, Calvin, Mark, Wesley, or just that. They don't care. But um, it seems that the patients, they just wanted you to be with them. And another misconception that I had was that we would sit in a little office, me and my cohorts, we'd sit in the office, and we'd go as people requested to see us. And that, that wasn't true either. We went room to room, door to door, visiting every single person, whether they, whether they were atheists, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, of all variations, didn't matter. It truly was an incarnational ministry of presence. You just sat and talked to them. But one of the entertaining things that emerged from our group, and there was about eight of us, um, was what our, our supervisor called the bad habits of chaplaincy. And I had two of them. The first was, I told everybody I came in contact with that I was going to I am not a Hey, I'm proud of I'm proud of the history. I'm proud of the tradition. I'm, I'm proud, proud of the, the teachings of the church. And that's how I grew up. And that's probably how I died. Um, but the second was I always told people that they need to go to church. Which you know, as a Christian chaplain, I thought that's what you would do. You know, apparently according to my supervisor, that just breaks off conversations. But uh, the church is my home away from home. It's my safe haven. I love going to church, and I, it was a big mark in the turnaround of my life, and I, thought, I think that everyone should, should do it. And one of the things that came out of that bad habit, though, is many people told me why they didn't go to church. And um, there were two reasons that came up over and over and over and over. The first being that it was full of hypocrites, which is nothing no one's ever heard. Your friends say it, your family say it. You probably have thought of yourself sometimes. You know, that's kind of a universal thing. But the, the, the people that tended to be in this camp were people who hadn't been to church for any extended length during their lifetime. Um, but the second reason really took me by surprise. Many people don't go to church because they don't feel their life is, is, is good enough yet to go to church. They need to fix their life first. And I was like, really? That was really surprising me, because I thought that's why you go to church. So that made me, that begs to ask the question of, has the church become a pile of blood? Because if the church has become a pile of blood, we're way off track. The church is supposed to be here for the broken. And so I implore you all, bring your brokenness into the church. Bring it up to this altar during communion today. Confess. Because if we can't do this ourselves, there's people who won't even darken our doorsteps until we do. If we won't bring our, our brokenness, why should anybody else? And so, even if that doesn't, even if neither one of those categories fit our church, and we do a lot of outreach, so I'm thinking maybe not, that's still the perception that people have in the church. Whether or not you like that or not, that's what you're fighting against. So, people do want to talk to their faith. So how do we get to those people? What are we going to do? We've got to figure it out. We've been commissioned by Jesus to enter into this world and minister to those people. And the author, the professor and Wesley scholar, Howard Snyder, is quoted as saying, the gospel says go. But so often our church buildings say stay. The gospel says, seek the lost, 
But our church buildings often say, let the lost seek the church. So let's take, let's take Jesus for example. That's a wild idea as Christians have. Um, his baptism was such a profound event, life-changing and powerful enough to change the world and decay. Such an impact and event that compelled Jesus to do a very unexpected and, and different thing. He went. Now this act of going was quite contrary to a lot of his contemporaries today. You know, holy men, men of God, in Jesus' day. It seemed to be the norm was they would stay and people would come to them. John the Baptist led a great revival at the, uh, the Jordan River. But if you wanted to go see Jordan, uh, if you wanted to go see John, he wasn't coming to you. You had to go down to the Jordan to see him. And he sings the Dead Sea Scroll community up in the Jay Mountains. Very pious, very very religious, expected a great cosmic cleanup just like John did. But if you wanted to join their community, you had to go to them. They were coming to you. And you could add the Pharisees and the Sadducees into that. They, was at, they resided in the uh, Jerusalem temple and the synagogues. But Jesus did use the traditional places. But he, was, he also was more than willing to take his message out to the people to bring a little bit of uh, God's kingdom to them. Origin, one of my favorite things. I love Origin. A lot of my friends know that. <laughs> it's on my Facebook. You can check it. Um, third century uh, uh, church father once said of Jesus' ministry, When Jesus then is with the multitudes, he is not in his house. For the multitudes are outside of the house. And it's an act which springs from his love to men to leave the house and to go away to those who are not able to come to him. So this is what Christians, Christians like us, we need, we need to ask if we're doing. What more can we do to bring a little of the kingdom of God's people who need it in our communities? Is waiting on them in our building good enough? And why not buck the trend of our day, sitting like Jesus did in his day? So in this morning's gospel lesson, Jesus meets up with some of the most despised, isolated, and lost people of his time, lepers. Now, Jesus' encounter with these lepers caused those around him to come to face, face with one of their worst fears and deepest prejudices. So does our relationship with Jesus cause us to come face to face with our deepest fears and our prejudices? Does our relationship with Christ cause us to reevaluate those fears? Because if it doesn't, it should. In our day, Hansen's disease is what they call leprosy. But in biblical times, it was a variety of skin diseases, and uh, the only way of prevention at that time was quarantine. The leper was considered utterly unclean, physically and spiritually. The leper couldn't approach within yards of people, including family members. They were nearly totally isolated. The leper was an outcast along with tax collectors, prostitutes, and beggars, and had no place in the religious community. Now, can you think of people in our communities that are facing the same situation? Does it remind you of a single teen mom, the drug addict, the alcoholic, the gang member? However, the outcasts of the time were, were who Jesus focused his ministry on. If you wanted to find out where Jesus was going to be, you could bet it was going to be with the lepers and the sinners. So what kind of ministry should we focus on? We also read about the healing of the ten lepers, and at least one of them was a Samaritan. We know that the Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. So why was a Samaritan even able to hang out with the Jewish lepers? Here I think we see a great law of life. A common illness had broken down national and social barriers. Race didn't matter. Economic status didn't matter. Social standing didn't matter. In the common tragedy of leprosy, they forgot that they were Jews and Samaritans, and only remembered that they were people in need. And as I researched this sermon, I came across a story about there was a guy telling about um, this guy grew up in an area that was prone to flash flood, flooding, and um, the stories he told about how animals acted during floods, and a piece of land was flooded over and only the hilltops were exposed, you could see animals on these hilltops sitting peacefully 
side by side, and these are animals that are normally mortal enemies. Yet they were sitting there peacefully. Likewise, people are drawn together in times of tragedy. For example, just drug abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse, all of the types of abuse. And, to, and it makes people forget all the social boundaries and to belong to the group. And usually these groups of belonging only intensify their issues. So why can't the church be the hilltop where people can congregate in peace and under the umbrella of love that's Jesus Christ? Surely one of the things that should draw people together is their common need for God. Race shouldn't matter. Economic status shouldn't matter. Social standing should not matter. The point is, though, is that we shouldn't require the marginalized to become whole before they enter into these doors. We should embrace them as they are and be the agent of change in their life in order for them to become whole. So what's holding us back from saying? By going out to, I guess I should clarify a few things. By going out and clip and, and ministering to people that I've been walking down uh, Nassau, helping people with your NRSV. And, uh, you could do that, but you wouldn't be following Jesus' example, because I don't remember ever hearing any gospel stories of Jesus grabbing the synagogue scrolls and walking around thumping sinners on the head. That was pretty much reserved for the, uh, the priests and the temple authorities. So if anyone has to worry about that, it's us. Would be pre preachers and teachers at the seminary, so that's uh, yeah. <laughs> you guys are <laughs> the um, The parable of the Good Samaritans are a good example of how we need to sometimes get over ourselves in order to help. Because I don't think that the priest and the Levite, I don't think that they passed by not wanting to help, but it was their strict adherence to the law that hindered them from showing God's love. And that it was a priest and a Levite that first passed is significant beyond the, the irony of the situation. It was people who were expected to help, and they didn't. While someone whom the victim and Jesus' audience would have despised did, the Samaritan. The priest may have had an excuse not to help, since a dying, or touching a dying or a bad wounded person was uh, would make him have to go through necessary cleansing rituals. Even though that wasn't forbidden, it, it kept him from help. So the priest decided being clean and more priestly was more important than saving someone else's life. The priest and the Levite were under the law. The Samaritan was not. So, have we created as Christians prejudices that keep us from reaching out and helping those in need? Are we sitting comfortably and idly by in our churches as the world around us is congregating on a hilltop in a false sense of security? Church planner Neil Cole once said, if you want to win the world to Christ, you're going to have to sit in the smoking section. If the church isn't willing to get its hands or lungs dirty, it won't have a hearing. The homes and the hearts of people are open to the gospel, but it's relationships that bring the gospel home. We're told by Jesus to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey, to obey everything that I command you. So we should gather as a community of faith to worship God together and learn, but we should also we're called to go out into the world and share that same grace. I'll read one more uh, passage for you. Matthew 25, 34, Jesus states, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see? You were thirsty, and give you something to drink. When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and go visit? And the king will reply, tell you the truth. Whatever you do to, for the least of these, you do for me. Let's 
a great responsibility and one the church usually falls short of. Mother Teresa, when asked why she was so focused on serving the poorest and most despised, despised people of Calcutta, India, replied that it was because each of them is Jesus in disguise. So if Jesus loved and cared enough for us to seek us out, why shouldn't we as Christians do the same for him? And this was going to be the end of my sermon, but I, if you will please, I'd like to tell one more story. <laughs> I didn't really know how to fit it in, and it kind of came to me today. But it's kind of a personal story, and I've, I've told this to people um, a little bit to people before. This summer, I, I, I had the privilege to minister to a, a young single mom of three kids. Um, this young lady had grown up in the church, was very active. And then her life went astray. And she felt she needed to leave. And no one came after her. And her life just spiraled out of control afterwards. And what brought her to the, um, the emergency room was that her two year old son had drowned. So, as we were sitting in this room, 10 by 10 uh, hospital waiting room, the weight and the gravity of the situation. And there was no hope inside. And as we prayed, that something else, something happened. As we sat and prayed and talked and begged for a miracle that would never come, we started uh, talking about our son and laughing about what kind of kid he was and um, how he brought joy to everyone who came in contact with him. And then we, we cried together as she told me about the lost dreams things that would never happen. Um, as, as this happened, I could feel the spirit of God moving around. And then she buried her face in her hands for about 20 minutes, tears screaming out of her arms. And she slowly lifted her, her face. And we locked gazes for what seemed like 10 minutes, but probably was only 10 seconds. But I always heard and, and, and remembered that quote by um, Mother Teresa. And I thought I fully understood it, but I never truly did until that moment. Because as she lifted her face and we walked gazes, I could see the face of Jesus staring back at me. Not literally, but figuratively. And it's the, the, the song we're going to sing next. It's, it's just like, you know, the things of earth are strange and dead. All it was was this, this beautiful face. But the sad reality is, this young woman will probably never get her life, life back in life. And the community she would left and has not reached back out to her will probably not come reach out now, her biggest tragedy. Has the church become a bias of love? Please, I beg you, bring your brokenness into church so that others feel like they can too. Amen. Amen.